Testing on YouTube, testing on YouTube. Testing on YouTube. YouTube works. Nice, okay. Now the last one. Thanks for the questions, Tim Anderson. You will have them answered. How's it going? The Yibian? The Yvian? So Tim Anderson is asking, what part of Lumiere's architecture makes time consistency better than others like Animate Diff? It's going to be the space-time diffusion, which you'll see. It's a pretty cool little trick that they do. And then what is the significance of the multi-diffusion model instead of the regular diffusion model? The multi-diffusion model is used to fix the time aliasing, which you'll also figure out. How's it going, Josh Phillips? All right, let me spit out this gum. Mounts this with a blast of the spiral didgeridoo, and then we'll get started. All right, welcome to another Hoopo stream. Today we're going to be looking at some video generation. So this stream is called Lumiere and HDIT. Lumiere is uh, from this paper here called uh, Lumiere, a space-time diffusion model for video generation. So the output of this is videos, right, it's generating video, and then the space-time diffusion model is the type of model architecture that they use. Uh, the second part of this uh, stream is gonna be on HDIT, which is this paper here. Scalable high resolution pixel space image synthesis with hourglass diffusion transformers. Kind of a little bit of a mouthful, but I think it represents where the image uh, generation uh, state of the art is right now. So we're going to start with some motivating uh, figures. So Lumiere is kind of popular right now, and it's all over the internet because it's a state-of-the-art text-to-video generation results. So maybe before we even uh, kind of look at the results, how do they determine that this is state-of-the-art? Well, they do it in basically the best way possible, which is what is known as a user study display. And in a user study display, you basically have a bunch of people sit in front of a computer and they get uh, fed basically two picture two videos side by side and then they get asked a question such as uh, which video is better which has more motion and better quality and then you basically get to pick and the person who's picking doesn't know which produced which so uh, specifically they used around 400 user judgments from the Amazon Mechanical Turk platform the Amazon Mechanical Turk platform is basically like a a service that you can use where Amazon will guarantee humans that are <laughs> relatively intelligent that will sit there and click through whatever surveys or quizzes you give them. So participants were presented with randomly selected pairs of videos, one generated by our model and the other one by one of the baseline methods. Participants were then asked to choose the video that they deemed better in terms of visual quality, motion, uh, how accurately it matched the prompt, and so on. So. They compare to all of the pretty much uh, state-of-the-art video models. So you have uh, Pika Labs, which is a startup video. You have Gen 2, which I think is from Runway ML. You have Animate Diff, uh, which we actually uh, reviewed in a stream. You have Image Gen Video, which I think we also reviewed in a stream. You have Zero Scope, and you have uh, this one here. The only one they, they don't uh, seem to include here comes from... This paper, which we also review, this is Stable Video Diffusion, Scaling Latent Video Diffusion Models to Large Datasets. I think this one probably comes close to Lumiere. The, to me, this was the kind of state of the art when it came out. When did it come out? It came out a little bit late last year. I don't really recall anymore. But uh, 
they did their homework and they basically compared to pretty much most of the state of the arts with this kind of user study and overwhelmingly the people chose the uh, uh, Lumiere so you can see here when asked about video quality the Lumiere compared to all the other ones people pretty much overwhelmingly preferred Lumiere same with the text alignment video quality and so on so actually here we go never mind they did compare it to SVD so uh, the st stability AI video diffusion model so yeah I think that is plenty of enough evidence to me to convince me that yes this is the state-of-the-art video generation model so now let's look at what state-of-the-art video generation looks like in uh, January of 2024 so here we have examples right and first thing I notice is that there's a lot more kind of like temporal consistency right if you notice like there's way less kind of like like morphing like if you look at the pause of this wolf I think there's one example in particular that I think is worth looking at yeah this here so you see this chocolate drizzle pouring over this vanilla ice cream the the quality of that is absolutely insane it's like consistent like the the volume stays the same it's just the craziest thing I've seen and this for example this astronaut walking also look at look how clean the legs are and how consistent they are they kind of like follow exactly as you would suppose so this dog is also pretty good so this is what state-of-the-art video generation looks like right now and there's still problems you know like for example here you got like the chewing looks a little bit weird on that giraffe some of the stuff is still a little little strange you know look at the the cat's paws kind of morph a little bit so we're not quite at uh, the top of the S curve, but we're getting pretty close. And I think with that, we should, I'm, I kind of want to start this by thinking about S curves. How's it going, Ed? How's it going, Aries? It's weird, but holy hell. And what, am I, what are we looking at here? So right now, this is a picture of what is normally known as an S curve. And this is the way that technology uh, kind of generally advances so in the beginning right the quality you can think of this y-axis as quality and then the x-axis as time so as you kind of increase time or the future moves forward kind of the quality of a technology really kind of starts increasing increasing increase and then it kind of kind of reaches this kind of top of the s curve where it kind of flattens out right and if you think about uh, video generation and image generation image generation is kind of like this first blue s curve where we're kind of at the point now where image generation is kind of peaked right like if you think about early last year you could still have a state-of-the-art image generation model and it was significantly better than the previous one right so there was a point where I actually started using mid journey because it was significantly better and then there was a point where I actually started using SDXL because it was better and then Dolly 3 because it was better but now they're all kind of the same you know and every single kind of image generation model kind of feels like the same they're kind of reaching this plateau of this top of the s curve here but video generation were really just at the beginning of the s curve right it seems like for for video generation we're kind of almost like here right we're right at the beginning of the takeoff and if i had to guess i feel like by the end of 2024 kind of mid of 2025 we're going to start getting to this point here right so that's kind of the choice for these two papers, right? This first paper, Lumiere, kind of represents the beginning of this takeoff curve for video generation. And then this second paper here, the HDIT uh, image diffusion paper, kind of represents to me kind of the, the maturation and the kind of diminishing returns of the top of the S curve when it comes to image generation. Because honestly, when I look at this paper, like, yes, these are very high quality images, but I've already seen these, right? I feel like mid-journey generates pretty much the same quality like Dolly 3 can also generate the same quality you can get the same quality with open source stable diffusion based models so we're kind of reaching the top of the S curve and people are really trying to like kind of add every single possible trick to make the image generation models better but that's not the point yet with video generation so Lumiere is the state of the art video generation but it's really just the beginning and uh, one kind of teaser here is that this is a uh, tweet just recently from Emad, which or Emad, which is the guy uh, who leads Stability AI, 
and he just mentioned here, try one of the experimental stability AI base models fresh from baking with some friends. This means that it's basically just stopped training and they showed him some demos. Feels like another stable diffusion moment. Here he's referring to the fact that whenever stable diffusion first came out, it was pretty much state of the art. Uh, what sorcery is this? Hold on to your asses, I guess. I'm thrilled, although a little concerned about how ill-prepared people are. So we don't really know what this is, right? This kind of follows the tradition of cryptic hype tweets on Twitter, but I think we're, we're if Lumiere is here, maybe what Imad has seen is here, right? So even though Lumiere is the state of the art in terms of video generation right now, it probably won't uh, retain that, that title, that throne for very much longer. I think this will be state of the art for a month or two, and then we'll see something new come out. So pretty excited. Uh, we're not that close with instructional image generation. Still got some leaps to go. Yeah, there's still some stuff to do, but I feel like we're we're kind of starting to get to this plateau here on image generation, at least in terms of quality. I think yeah, you're more referring to like adherence to the actual prompt. Okay, so let's dive into it. Who made this Lumiere model? So this is a paper coming out of Google Research and then uh, a variety of different kind of Israeli institutions. Like I don't know, but it feels like a lot of these names are Israeli flavored. This came out 23rd January 2024, so relatively recent work. And uh, here we have some results here. Sample results generated by Lumiere, including text to video generation. So this is when you just feed a text, a prompt, and then you just get the full video. Uh, image to video, which is the second row, which is you just you give it a real image or a generated image, one starting image, and then it generates basically the rest of the video. So you can see here they gave it the picture of the rabbit or the picture of the elephant and generated the rest. Style reference generation, which is a cool trick that they did in this paper, which I haven't really seen before, but it's basically you uh, generate a video from a prompt, but then you give it a reference image for the style. And this, this stuff looks pretty fucking crazy. So if we actually go to the Lumiere here, this is uh, what it looks like, right? So for example, here's the style image, and then here's a bunch of different videos that follow that style. And there's all kinds of like emergent kind of weirdness here. So here's the style image of these mushrooms, and then here's kind of a bunch of different videos that follow that style, and so on. But one thing that they kind of point is that when the style image is kind of drawn and includes like kind of like lines like this, the video itself has this like, it slowly draws out the thing, which is kind of interesting. I think that's just representative of the type of videos that it's been trained on, but this kind of stylized video generation, very cool. And then finally, this over here is in-painting. In-painting is whenever you basically crop out part of a video and then you ask it to generate that part of the video. So here's actually even cooler stylized results. So you have the original source video and then stylized to be made of wooden blocks. Like the consistency here is really great. But this is the in-painting, right? So you can basically just in-paint and choose which specific part of the video you want to uh, animate. So right here you can in-paint, for example, this part here, and then you can see how it starts, it creates, it hallucinates this cake getting chocolate drizzled on top of it. All right, so how do they do this? We introduced Lumiere, a text-to-video diffusion model designed for synthesizing videos that portray realistic, diverse, and coherent motion. To this end, we introduce a space-time unit architecture that generates the entire temporal duration of the video at once. So this isn't like other techniques and they're going to kind of go through what previous video generation techniques were like but in this case it's going to be generating the entire video in in one basically shot it's not one shot in the sense of like a generative adversarial network or anything like that it's still a diffusion model so it basically uh, operates over a series of time steps and noise removal but uh, it is it does the whole video at once rather than kind of being this multi-stage pipeline that generates frames of a video and then kind of fills them in and so on or, I guess I should have just read this, this is in contrast to existing video models which synthesize distant keyframes followed by temporal super resolution, an approach that inherently makes global temporal consistency difficult to achieve, right? And global temporal consistency is consistency across the time dimension over the whole uh, video itself, right? So that's what global temporal consistency means. By deploying both spatial and temporal down and up sampling and leveraging a pre-trained text to image diffusion model, so they're the interesting thing here is that they're not going to be training this from scratch. They're basically going to be training this 
they're going to be doing what's called inflating, which basically means that they're going to take a pre-trained text image diffusion model, which is like something like a stable diffusion, and then they're going to add additional layers, freeze the original pre-trained layers, and then train those new layers, and this is called inflating. So I think that has ramifications because what it means is that this technique is not uh, out of reach of all the other competitors, right? When I first saw this paper, I was like, oh, okay, so Google releases a state-of-the-art video generation model. It kind of makes sense. They have YouTube. They have this giant data set. Like, they're just going to be able to beat everyone else just because they have a higher quality data set than pretty much a higher quality, higher size data set than everybody else. But that's not the case, right? The actual improvement of this is entirely from a architectural design choice and that architectural design choice is actually relatively simple to implement and they basically fully tell you what it is right here this uh, space-time unit and anybody can do this right so the people at stability AI the people at Pika labs the people at runway ML they're probably implementing this at right now as we speak and this was this uses a pre-trained text to image model right so they didn't have to train this from scratch in fact they only trained it on a really small data set here let's see if I can find the exact thing here yeah we trained our text to video model on a data set containing 30 million videos along with their text captions that's nothing right if we actually go to for example the stable video diffusion so this is the stable video diffusion one this one was trained on significantly more, right? Large video data set comprising of roughly 600 million samples. So that's impressive, right? So state-of-the-art video generation, if they would have just done it by just using YouTube and their giant data set, okay, that's impressive, but not that impressive. But the fact that they do this entirely with just a clever choice of architecture and then just fine-tune or not fine-tune in this case they're training the layers that they inflate but with using a really small data set that's super impressive to me and I think it's also great because it means other companies are going to be able to copy this and then have their own uh, versions of this uh, okay our model learns to directly generate a full frame rate low resolution video by processing it at multiple space-time scale so there's gonna be a hierarchy here in the space dimension and in the time dimension we demonstrate state-of-the-art text-to-video generation results and show that our design easily facilitates a wide range of content creation tasks such as video editing, image to video, video in painting, and stylized generation. So that's it guys, pretty, pretty hype. Okay. Uh, this is more video, more uh, figures here showing the temporal consistency in generated videos. Uh, representative examples of generated videos using our model and image gen video. So here, what they're this XT slice, what they're talking about is a slice that has a uh, time. So this is the time dimension here, and then the X corresponds to basically just the pixels along this row. So this green line of pixels here. They're basically saying here is what that green line is, but we're going to put it vertically. So it's you're basically looking at the two legs of this uh, kind of marionette that's running on this treadmill. Image Gen is a previous generation of video uh, generative models, and you can see here that the temporal consistency of these legs is just not good. This is basically a very good way of visualizing what the kind of like morphing artifacts that you see in videos. Uh, from previous generation video models look like. You see this weird kind of morphing compared to this model, the Lumiere model. You can see how it's much more consistent. The legs basically consistently move in a pattern that makes sense given a treadmill run and they kind of overlap in the right ways. And here's just the same thing. So here just showing off how the legs are consistent, right? The legs of the... Uh, which is here, for example, the elephant legs. You see how those elephant legs are actually temporally consistent with each other. Okay. Uh, introduction. We have text-to-image models, which they abbreviate as T2I. We have text-to-video models, which they abbreviate as T2V. Uh, the problem with text-to-video models is that the added temporal data dimension, aka the time, the fact that you don't just have a single image, you have basically now a sequence of images in time, introducing significant challenges in terms of memory and compute requirements, right? So if you thought that generating images 
took a lot of memory and compute, right? Imagine a sequence of images now. So it kind of adding that extra dimension makes the computed memory explode here as well as the scale of the required training data to learn this more complex distribution. I don't think this is as much of a problem because there's a huge amount of video data on the internet. I feel like it's kind of underexploited right now, which means that we should be able to make relatively rapid progress once we actually start uh, using good architectures such as the one in this paper to uh, train state-of-the-art T2V models, right? And I can't wait. I can't wait for Google to basically take this paper and this model architecture and then train it from scratch uh, on the YouTube data set that they have. So a prevalent approach among e existing T2V models is to adopt a cascaded design in which a base model generates distant keyframes and subsequent temporal super resolution models generate the missing data between the keyframes and non-overlapping segments. Okay, so basically the way that most previous T2V models work is they they will generate frames of a video, right? So if you have a video at 30 frames per second that is two seconds long, that's 60 total frames, right? So it'll generate maybe every 10th frame and then it'll fill in in between, right? And the every 10th frame, these are called key frames, and then you basically uh, generate the missing data in between. You kind of like interpolate between them. This is memory efficient, but then the ability to generate globally coherent motion doesn't really work well, right? You end up with these weird kind of morphing artifacts. And like, what is an, a, a kind of a more precise way of of describing what that morphing artifact is? So what that kind of the more mathematical way of describing that is known as uh, temporal aliasing, right? The base model generates an aggressively subsampled set of keyframes in which fast motion becomes temporally aliased and thus ambiguous. So what is temporal aliasing? So I think this is probably the easiest picture to explain what aliasing is, right? You guys are probably familiar uh, with this term from something like video games. But here you have what should be a straight line, and then in aliasing, you end up with this kind of like step pattern, right? And then anti-aliasing kind of adds this weird uh, kind of like diffuse to it so that it looks a little bit more straight if you squint your eyes and stand far away from it. But what is a more formal mathematical definition of aliasing is that Aliasing is the result of undersampling. So basically, if you had some signal here, some kind of sine curve, and you adequately sampled it, you would basically get the signal. But if you were to undersample it, so you see how many, how much less samples you have here, you could basically end up with a distortion to the original signal. So whenever they're talking about here temporal aliasing, that's what they're talking about. They're basically saying that there's an aliasing happening because you're undersampling in the dimension of time. Okay, temporal super resolution modules are constrained to a fixed small temporal context window. So here they're talking about that the super resolution window is basically trying to fill in between two keyframes. So it doesn't have a global uh, kind of awareness. It doesn't know about what's happening in the entire video. It's just kind of myopically focused on like interpolating between these two keyframes. And because of that, it basically loses that global information and cannot consistently consistently resolve aliasing ambiguities across the full duration of the video. Uh, and then finally, I guess the last kind of uh, negative of current existing T2V models is that cascading regiment, training regiments in general suffer from a domain gap where the TSR model is trained on real dance sampled video frames, but at inference time is used to interpolate generated frames, which accumulates errors. So when you're training this, right, the TSR model sees real video for real video keyframes because it's being trained on real videos, right? And because of that, it learns to kind of interpolate between real frames, which is an easier task than interpolating between generated frames, right? So it's kind of like how if you feed a real image into an image to video model, that it looks a little bit better than if you generate an image with a generative model and then inter and then you feed that into an image to video model, right? So uh, that's uh, what they're referencing there. Okay, so the way that they're going to be different from these existing T2V models is they're going to basically have an entirely new type of architecture, which they call their space-time unit, which generates the full temporal duration of the video at once. Okay, so here's uh, figure three, which kind of goes a little bit deeper into what exactly is this space-time unit doing. Okay, so here we have uh, a sequence of frames. So here you have five seconds of, of, of video, right? Five seconds of video at 
whatever this is, 12 frames per second, 18 frames per second, 16 frames per second, which means you have a total of 80 frames. So here you have 80 frames, right, laid out in time. And the way that these uh, original video models work is they'll basically sample, you see this, sampling across the all the sequence but only every X amount of frames right and getting only these keyframes and then you're really only generating images for each of those keyframes you see so you only generated the frame at time one and then the frame at time one second you know so then you would have to use this temporal super resolution model to basically interpolate between those you see so you're, you start with the keyframes that's what's actually being generated by the diffusion model and then you have a super resolution model which interpolates between those which is also a diffusion model but this is the kind of main meat right and then here you have uh, even higher uh, super resolution models which this is temporal super resolution so it adds the the, the extra time that you need the actual extra resolution in time see it fills in from here to here and then this is a spatial super resolution model so this is just a 128 by 128 image which is like a little tiny grainy thumbnail so if you actually want this to be a 1024 by 1024 uh, image which is kind of more product quality and what you would expect a user to consume then you have to run it through this additional SSR so they still have this SSR here right so the Lumiere model still only generates these 128 by 128 kind of little thumbnail pictures but it doesn't do this kind of keyframe approach of generating first keyframes and then using a separate temporal super resolution model to generate uh, the in-between it basically generates every single frame all 80 of the frames in one shot or not one shot but through the iterative denoising that is a uh, diffusion model uh, TSR is temporal super resolution, SSR is spatial super resolution. Uh, the base model in our framework processes all frames at once. To obtain the high resolution video, we apply an SSR on overlapping windows and utilize multi diffusion. So this is a little bit of a throwaway trick here, but uh, the, uh, the author of this paper, this guy here, Omer Bartal, he has a previous paper here called multi-diffusion fusing diffusion paths for controlled image generation this is early 2023 this is the same guy Omer Baltal and this paper it's a little overly complicated but it's a relatively simple concept it's basically uh, combining uh, multiple images and generating them such that you kind of get cleaner in between right so here you have a kind of a panorama that's been generated kind of one frame at a time and then obviously they're using the same prompt but because they start basically from different noise and they generate along iteratively remove uh, noise along kind of a different path you end up with basically these discontinuities what this multi diffusion does is it basically uh, generates in such a way that it's kind of like trying to minimize the difference between these kind of overlapping areas and you end up with basically a uh, a way of generating a larger kind of diffusion that is kind of in between two things that you want right so that that's what they're doing here is that they're basically using this multi diffusion model to make sure that the overlap between these is nice right because if you just were to do it here right you see how they're doing the spatial super resolution but they're applying it to one set here and then the other set here Right, it might be the case that at this discontinuity you end up with basically like a little, like a flash, right? Like almost like a little blip where like s the the texture and the kind of like high frequency details kind of like they're not consistent because you're not you're doing this these two parts separately. So they have a little bit of overlap here on the super resolution models using this multi diffusion uh, model, which is from the same author, in order to kind of fix that particular issue with previous uh, video generation models where you have that the the kind of window effect or the the hard boundary effect when you're doing the super resolution okay uh, generates full temporal du duration of the video at once and now the core part of this paper which is this uh, space-time unit here they actually say that it's surprising that no one has really looked at this, right? They say that 
Surprising that this design choice has been overlooked, which followed the convention to include only spatial downsampling and upsampling in the architecture and assumed a fixed temporal resolution. So here they're talking about where this is a diffusion model too, and this diffusion model here has a unit in it, but the unit is only operating in the space dimension, right? You kind of want a unit that operates in both the space and the time dimension, right? So they're saying it's kind of weird that nobody thought about this, and in that uh, kind of vein, I pulled up, here's a Francois Chalet uh, tweet. Francois is the guy who did Keras, and he's also known for kind of having spicy tweets, but he says, the skills needed for developing new ML techniques have little overlap with the skills needed for applying ML effectively. A bit like how chip design has a little overlap with software engineering. And I think that this kind of, to me, motivates and kind of paints a little bit more as to why previous T2V models overlooked this design choice. And I think this starts, this feeds into a little bit of kind of the Rich Sutton bitter lesson as well, where humans just have a very hard time kind of removing complexity, right? Humans, especially humans in a research organization or in one of these kind of uh, tech companies, like the incentives are set up so that basically incrementalism is what you want to be doing, right? You basically want to take things that already work and then kind of maybe combine them in an interesting way or incrementally add a little bit of extra functionality or add this little trick from over here and combine it here. So like that kind of incrementalism is pretty much most research. And that type of incrementalism is actually not the way that you get uh, new, interesting, novel model architectures, which is what Lumiere is, right? Lumiere is, is you have to think differently. You have to be like, okay, instead of like, hey, can we add one extra little thing here to this TSR in order to make it slightly better? You have to be like, is there a way to remove complexity, remove some of these uh, inductive biases, try to think about this problem a little differently, and then create the architecture from that, right? And I think that's that's kind of, I guess, what I was trying to get at with this, uh, why Chalet is saying, is that the people who make these new model architectures that, such as the Transformer or the ConvNet when it first came out, like, you have to be thinking differently. You can't be in this kind of, like, uh, uh, this kind of, like, incrementalist, kind of, like, more software engineering kind of paradigm, which is good for incrementally increasing performance. And I think this other paper that we're going to be looking at, right, this paper here, the HDIT, is very much that kind of paper, right? This HDIT paper, if you look at it, it's so complex, like so much complexity here. Like they're adding like every single random little trick you've ever heard of and then 10 different tricks that you've never even heard of, putting them all in there, and then you end up with basically an incremental slight improvement over the existing state of the art for image generation. And that to me is also why I feel like the the image generation is kind of on this S curve here where it's like in order to get to in order to do this part of the S curve you need this kind of like intuitive kind of ground up uh, kind of removing functionality type of first principles thinking in order to really get up this part of the acceleration but then once you get into this part here the top part of the S curve that then becomes dominated by this kind of more incrementalist kind of like add together all the different little tricks and just make sure that there's no stone left unturned, no little tiny inductive bias that you couldn't just modify in some little tiny way. But I think it ta it tells a picture of different different technologies at different levels of maturity. So what image generation needs is incrementalist improvement. What video generation needed, which this paper basically showed, is it needed kind of a more ground up rethinking of what architecture should we be using for this type of model. Okay, so they're going to be building Lumiere on top of a pre-trained T2I model. So here I am talking about incrementalist thinking, and, and here they are literally saying that they're going to be using a pre-trained text-to-image model. But I think that's good, and again, the reason I think that's good is because it means that you can basically recreate Lumiere, uh, but recreate it on top of stable diffusion, or recreate it on top of whatever video, or whatever image model Gen 2 and Pika are using, even though I, I would almost bet money that Gen 2 and Pika are using stable diffusion, because they probably don't have the money to burn uh, to train their own image model. Uh, common SSRs use the temporal windowing approach which splits the videos into non-overlapping segments, 
segments and stitches together those results. However, this leads to inconsistencies in appearances at the boundaries between windows. Here they're just kind of uh, talking about this specific little trick that they use here where they overlap the spatial super resolution modules to, to kind of fix that uh, inconsistencies at the boundaries between those. Uh, we demonstrate state-of-the-art video generation results. A uh, plethora of video, generating stylized videos that comply with a given style image. Finally, we demonstrate that generating full videos at once allows us to invoke easily off-the-shelf editing methods. All right, so the fact that you can generate this full video in one uh, diffusion process means that all this other shit that they advertised here is actually easier. So in painting, stylizing, image to video, text to video, all of those become simpler now that you've made the architecture simpler. Uh, okay. Uh, related work here they're going to talk about all the greatest hits of the past so everything from dolly 2 to stable diffusion right text to image video text to image models got pretty good and then people started to try to do text to video models and they were not that great but now we're starting to get there uh, text to video generation uh, here's some greatest hits for t2v you have s stable video diffusion what else? Interestingly, the ubiquitous convention of existing inflation schemes is to maintain a fixed temporal resolution across the network, which limits the ability to process full-length clips. In this work, we design a new inflation scheme, and inflation here is uh, the idea of basically adding additional layers, right, and then not messing with the other layers. So you're inflating, you take in a neural network, and then you're basically adding layers in between and training those in between layers. So it's almost like a kind of like a control net if you want to think of it that way. Uh, learning to downsample the video in both space and time and performing the majority of the computation of the compressed space time feature space of the network. Okay, so this is another awesome kind of uh, windfall of their particular architectural choice, right? So here you have their ST units, their space-time unit architecture. So here you have uh, a video, right? A video is a sequence of frames. These, those frames have some height, they have some width, and then there's uh, a sequence of them, which is this T dimension, that's the time. So you have the time, and then you have the height and width is the space dimensions, right? So space and then time. So here, what a unit does is it basically downsamples using convolution. Right, so convolution-based blocks, which consists of pre-trained T2I layers. So those are the layers that are coming from your pre-trained text image model, which could be your stable diffusion, followed by a factorized space-time convolution. Okay, so now you're going to convolve in the dimension of time as well, which means that you're going to be able to reduce this dimensionality of time. So you see here how H becomes h over 2, becomes h over 4, right? So you're getting smaller and smaller in the space dimension, and then t becomes t over 2, becomes t over 4. So you're also using convolution to downsample in the time dimension. So I have here, in case some of you aren't super familiar with a convnet, so this is a kind of, kind of a dated uh, visualization, but I think it's, it's a pretty cool one. So this is a visualization of a convolutional network for digit classification known as MNIST, right? So if I draw for example, the number three here, right? This is showing you uh, basically the each of the layers of the convolutional neural network, right? And it's a really cool little visualization because you can basically say, oh, well, how did where does this little block come from? And then it'll show you, well, it comes from here, right? So you can see that in a convolutional network, right? Ever, the, the blocks at the higher spatial resolutions come from basically convolution, which is this operating of this operation of taking a kernel and then basically just convolving it across the image. You see that? Boom, 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 boom. But the important thing to to kind of get from this, the intuition to build, is that what convolution is really good at doing is it's good at doing this downsampling. So look at how basically the width of the images gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you go higher up, right? There's more of them, so you see how there's more of these little thumbnails, but Th that's just the D dimension here, so the feature dimension, sometimes also called the channel dimension here, but then as you go higher up in the hierarchy, it tends to be called the feature dimension, but D1 is going to be less than D2, is going to be less than D3, but the H and W are going to be smaller and smaller. You see that? You see how this is bigger than this, which is bigger than this, which is bigger than this, so it's very good at spatially downsampling, right? That's what convolution is good at, and they're basically doing convolution not just in the space of H and W, but also in the time dimension. So that's why you can basically keep 
reducing, 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 reducing. And here is the kind of magic free lunch that they get from this is that they're not going to do the attention mechanism, right? So you're going to have some kind of attention mechanism inside this unit, right? Ultimately, right, you're going to have to feed in this information here, right? The actual prompt, this an elephant walking in a forest, teddy bear surfers ride the wave, right? That's going to be a sequence of tokens. And in order to generate a video based on that, right, you're going to have to have an attention mechanism that is computing the attention between the text tokens or whatever uh, conditioning you want to use, and then the actual uh, kind of like visual information, right? And the problem with these attention uh, mechanisms is that they're uh, O of n squared with respect to the length of the input sequence. So that's, that's kind of a mouthful, but uh, I think they describe it here in this paper a little bit cleaner. But Computational complexity increases quadratically, O of n squared, for images of h by w by channels, where n is the w by h, right? So this O of n squared, most people are familiar about thinking about that in terms of a transformer for text, because the sequence is literally the sentence. It's, it's already kind of a, text is already naturally kind of a sequence. But whenever you're using uh, images, right, you can think of it like, like the h and the w, if you multiply them together, that's going to give you some length and the attention mechanism is going to be O of n squared with respect to that length, right? And then I guess just because I showed you guys uh, a little visualization of a ConvNet, I got to show you guys a little visualization of a uh, attention mechanism. So this is another very cool little visualization. And by the way, if you ever want to see these links, this is uh, you can find them. This is a GitHub stream docs. Uh, and down here, I have all the links for all the different visualizations. So but I want to go over specifically the attention block here uh, just to show you guys kind of what this is like. All right, so you have self-attention, and generally attention has multiple heads. So you can see here there's multi-heads. This is one head of attention. This is your sequence, so you can see here that uh, imagine one of these columns for each of the uh, uh, visual tokens and then one of these columns for each of the image tokens, right? This is self-attention, but in the... Uh, ST unit, it would be cross attention. But the key part here is this attention matrix here, right? So basically, for every single one of these elements in the sequence, you're going to have to calculate this Q. Let's keep going. You're going to have to, boom, there's your dot product. Look how pretty this is. Add those all up, and boom. There you add your bias, right? So your weights multiply, and then you add your bias, and there you go. You just get one of those little squares. So you're going to have to do that for every single one. Look how much little computation that is. And look how it, the computation is, is, is linear depending on you have to basically do it for every single one of these uh, elements of your sequence. Every single one of these tokens, you have to do that whole little, uh, little shtick that just happened there. And then on top of that, you have to calculate this attention matrix. And this is where it becomes... Uh, n squared, right? Because basically for every single one of these little dots here in this attention matrix, every to fill in every single one of those parts, you're going to have to calculate the Q times the K and then divide softmax plus, so see dot product between the Q and the K, I think they have the actual, here it is. But you see that the problem with this is that it's now n of its n squared. I think I'm kind of messing with this, but there's your softmax, and then there's your V. So that's the output of attention. And that's basically it, guys. That's the attention mechanism, but I just love seeing this because it's really cool. <laughs> Definitely recommend. Okay, but okay, so now that I've kind of. Uh, overly verbosely described why attention is O of n squared, why is it important here that they basically only do, uh, in this work, we designed a new inflation scheme which continues to learn to downsample, performing the majority of the computation in the compressed space-time feature space of the network, right? So by compressing this video, which is a huge amount of H, W, and T, 
by spatially downsampling in both space and then uh, time using convolution, they can get these tiny little thumbnails of which there's a lot less of them. And then here is where they actually do the attention, right? And then they upsample that and then back to the back to the full video. So they've basically gotten a little bit of a free lunch where they only need to do attention here in this heavily time and space downsampled uh, representation of the video. Okay, uh, and that's that's the end of the kind of related work section, and now they're kind of kind of dig right into it and describe their lumière. Lumière, by the way, means light in French. Lumière, which is the name of the the lamp dude in uh, Beauty and the Beast too. So we utilize diffusion probabilistic models as our generative approach. These models are trained to approximate a data distribution. So right diffusion models uh what they do is they add noise to some data and then they learn to basically remove that noise or predict that noise in this case the distribution of data is basically all videos ever created in the world that's ideally what you want but you can't get that data distribution because you can't have every single video that could possibly ever be imagined so you have a subsample of that which is maybe 30 million video, 30 million videos or the youtube data set or whatever you have right Starting from a Gaussian IID noise sample, this is the noise that you start with whenever you're doing this diffusion. The diffusion model gradually denoises it until it reaches a clean sample drawn from the approximate target distribution. And the whole point, the whole thing that you're learning is you're basically trying to get this approximated target distribution to be as close as possible to the true data distribution, which is the space of all possible videos. Uh, diffusion models can learn a conditional distribution. So the conditional distribution is uh, basically the additional conditioning, which can be text, such as here. Uh, our framework consists of a base model and a spatial super resolution model. So the base model is the one that this STU net that actually gives you every single frame, right? And it's doing the attention mechanism only at the lowest resolution. And then it uses the same kind of spatial super resolution to basically go from a series of 128, 128 images to 1024 by 1024. Okay. Uh, resulting with a high resolution video, we described the key design choices. Okay. To make our problem computationally tractable, this is just a fancy way of saying to make it computationally cheaper and able to be done, we propose to use a space time unit which downsamples the input signal both spatially and temporally and performs the majority of its computation on this compact space-time representation. And I don't know about you guys, but this is great because there was a point where I was starting to get a little bit scared, right? And I was looking, we were reading, uh, when we read Animate Diff, when we read Stable Video Diffusion, these were these were starting to get pretty complex, right? So it was, it was a little bit unsettling that video diffusion models were starting to get more and more complex. And I was like, fuck, dude, this is stuff is going to get just so complicated and it's going to be really, really annoying to deal with. But this Lumiere paper is such a breath of fresh air because it means that by going, taking a step backwards, you can get better results, right? By simplifying the abstraction and the inductive biases, you get a better result. So now, when I'm thinking about, okay, well, in 2028, right, we're not going to be thinking about two-dimensional videos anymore, right? We're all going to be wearing VR headsets, and we're all going to be thinking about basically four-dimensional videos, basically a Gaussian splat with a time dimension. How the fuck do you make a Gaussian splat with a time dimension? Well, just add it right here, you know? There's Instead of W, H by T, it's gonna be W, H by D, right? Because there's now gonna be the depth, right? There's three dimensions of space and now time. So somebody needs to do this. Somebody needs to make this STU net architecture for four dimensional uh, space-time Gaussians. And there you go. Maybe we got the architecture for the generative Gaussian splat models of the future is going to be based kind of similarly on this. So, I don't know, it kind of makes me excited there. Uh, I guess we got more pictures here, but I'll, I'll let you guys look at those. Uh, we interleave temporal blocks in the T2I architecture and insert temporal up and down sampling, down and up sampling modules following each pre trained spatial resizing module. So, here they're referring to the fact that. Uh, the spatial part, the spatial downsampling, right, the, the kind of convolution in space that downsamples the space, that part already exists. That's the pre-trained text-to-image model, right? The pre-trained stable diffusion model already has 
these convolution layers that spatially downsample. So those are the pre-trained spatial layers, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to be adding, basically inflating the architecture, inflate with the little quotes there, by adding these extra layers. So you're keeping you're keeping the already pre-trained spatial resizing layers, and then you're inserting temporal, uh, which is in the time dimension, up and down sampling layers, basically. Uh, we incorporate temporal attention only at the course's resolution. This uh, saves them with the O of n squared because attention is O of n squared. Uh, the common inflation approach ensures that at initialization, the T2V model is equivalent to a pre-trained T2I model, right? So this is uh, basically the same as a control net, right? In a control net, you basically have the same idea where you're adding an additional kind of layers to an existing text-to-image model, and you initialize those layers basically with zeros such that at the very beginning, before you've done any kind of training or pushed any gradients, the model is effectively the same. And that's what they're saying here, right? Is that basically when they add these extra layers, right? They're they're adding them and initializing them in such a way that they don't impact any of the pre-trained layers that are already there from the text to image model. So if you were to take their uh, spatial uh, STU net model and just run it before you push any gradients into it, it would literally just generate uh, videos as a collection of independent image samples and it would just be completely fine. Right? We empirically find that initializing these modules, such as they perform nearest neighbor down and up sampling, operations results with a good starting point. So this is kind of how they initialize those uh, inflated layers. Uh, Multi-diffusion for spatial super resolution. This is the, the trick that they use here, right, to basically have a little bit of overlap. And I don't really think they needed this. You know, I feel like if they would have kept this paper a little bit more pure, a little bit more clean, they could have just not had that in there, but obviously this guy here, he's going to kind of not, uh, he citing your own work is an opportunity to get more citations, and it's also just kind of, it can come from a good place too, so it doesn't necessarily need to come from the place of like he's trying to get more citations for himself. It's, it could also just be that he's very familiar with this, he already wrote the code for this, and he's like, hey, if I did this, I might as well just include it in this paper and also get some uh, slightly better results, so that's this multi diffusion for spatial resolution. This is a nice little summary of it though, right? And you know it's going to be a good summary because it's the guy who wrote the original paper trying to summarize it in a one section of this new paper. So this is probably the best little uh, summary of what multi diffusion is. The inflated SSR network can only operate on short segments. To avoid temporal boundary artifacts, we achieve smooth transitions between the temporal segments by employing multi diffusion. There's the citation, boom, plus one along the temporal axis. At each generation step, we split the noisy input video. So here's your input video, which has height, width, time, and then three, three is the channel dimension. Every single image has three channels, red, green, and blue, into a set of overlapping segments, J, I, from one to N. Those overlapping segments are this, right? You have non-overlapping segments with a temporal boundary right here, and then you have overlapping segments here where there's a little bit of overlap. Uh, Blah, blah, blah. Ji is the ith segment, which has some temporal duration, which is a subset of the total duration. To reconcile the per segment predictions, we define the result of a denoising step to be solution of this optimization problem. Right. So largely what's going on here is it's, you see this, uh, this uh, squared. So it's basically just a squared loss between the two kind of overlaps. The solution to this problem is given by linearly combining the predictions over overlapping windows. So it's a little... It, it, you know, this paper, like you look at you look at his uh, multi diffusion paper, and it looks kind of super intense. It looks extremely cryptic and intense, but then his little summary is just like, oh, it's just a squared here, and then you just linearly combine the predictions. So, a little bit simpler than it appeared. Applications: the lack of a temporal super resolution cascade makes it easier to attend extend Lumiere to downstream applications. We demonstrate by doing all these different. Uh, uh, editing type things such as style condition generation, image to video, in painting, out painting, and cinema graphs. This is great. All right, question from Ed. Don't they usually do attention to every step of the downsampling rather than only at the bottom of the unit? Yeah, I think in, so if we look at stable diffusion model arc, 
right? Look at this. So this is the standard open image new tab. This is the standard text to image diffusion model known as stable diffusion, right? So it's a latent diffusion model. And what that means is that it's encoding the image and then performing the actual diffusion process in the latent space. But what Ed is referring to here is that you see this uh, attention here. It's being done not just here, it's being done at multiple spatial resolutions. So you have attention happening here, you have attention happening here, you have attention. At, so it's like happening at multiple spatial resolutions, which is different than what they do here in the Lumiere where they only have the attention right at the lowest, right at that bottleneck where the dimension is smallest, right? So that's kind of what, it's just great. I just love this kind of stuff where they simplify it and then they make it better by simplifying it, right? And because they only have this attention uh, in this compressed space-time feature bottleneck here, then it's less compute, right? One way, the reason it doesn't matter as much here is because you're already encoding it, right? So in this uh, stable diffusion model here, you can perform this attention mechanism here at multiple levels of uh, the spatial resolution because this uh, resolution here at the top and end of the unit is already kind of small because this Z of T is what's coming out of your encoder decoder. So it's it's not like you're you're doing an attention mechanism at a resolution that's similar to this, right? You're doing it in a compressed representation anyway. So, but I don't know. I just think it's a lot cleaner to just do it in one place right in the middle. Okay. Uh, stylized generation, we were here. Uh, previous work showed that substituting the T2I weights, we observed that the simple plug and play often results in distorted or static video. So, here they're talking about taking a pre-trained text-to-image model and then adding basically, for example, something like a LoRa. A LoRa, you can think of it like basically little delta Ws. It's like a little change to the weights. And LoRas are used to basically uh, have your text-to-image model generate slightly different styles, right? So there's different LoRas that people have trained for different styles. And you can add that to existing merge it into the existing text to image weights and then get a model that effectively generates in that style. But they try to do this and it doesn't work quite as well for them because this is probably because they added these these extra spatial layers, right? They, they kind of messed with this model enough via the inflation by adding these extra layers in there for the time that you can't just basically put the LoRa's naively in there. But they uh, basically linearly interpolate between the fine-tuned text to image weights W style and the original T2I weights W original and pretty much get pretty good things. So solved that, dodged that bullet. You can still use LoRa's for this. Uh, results from various styles. This is the interesting uh, result here. Uh, realistic spatial priors derived from vector art result in corresponding unique non-realistic motion. The line drawing style results in animations that resemble pencil strokes drawing the desired scene, while the cartoon style results in content that gradually pops out and reconstructs the scene. So this is the interesting kind of emergent behavior that we were looking at, that if you look at these stylized uh, videos, not, not this these ones, but this one here, where they basically use the styles, that if you give it a style that is very obviously drawn, the video that comes out of this from image to video has or the stylized video draws it, right? This one, it doesn't draw it because this is not a drawn picture, right? This one, I guess it doesn't draw it either, right? But then this one, it draws it. So I think this is probably more just the result of the data distribution, right? Whatever videos they train this on, the ones that happen to be pencil drawings probably are like drawn in that exact way, which is why the model basically just spits that out to you. So I don't think that has to do with like the specific, some kind of weird like cartoons or like this, but it's like, I think it's more just the result of the videos that they train this on. Okay, conditional generation. So generating conditioned on something such as text. We extend our model to video generation conditioned on additional input signals. We achieve this by modifying the video to take as input two signals. So you have your noisy video of time by height by width by three. And then they add this masked conditioning video, which is the same dimensions, time by width by height by three, or time by height by width by three. 
and uh, M, which is a mask, such that the overall input to the model is the concatenated tensor. So you see now how they've concatenated this tensor along the channel dimension. So you see now instead of time by h by w by 3, it's now time by h by w by 7. And you're like, wait a second, why is it 7 and not 9? It's because this is a binary mask, so it only has one channel. We expand the channel dimension from 3 to 7 in order to accommodate the modified input. During this fine-tuning process, we take J to be the noisy version of the training video, C to be the masked version of the training vi clean video. This encourages the model to learn to copy the unmasked information into the output video while only animating the masked content. So this is how they can do this masked uh, video stuff. Let's go to the actual page to look at the examples of that. Oh. Uh-oh. My stream is freezing but this stuff here. So this is how they do the mask, right? They basically feed some additional mask, which here would be a binary mask where basically everything here is zero except for this, the stuff inside the square, and then the space-time unit is fine-tuned in such a way that now you can get basically video in only the parts that you want. But the interesting thing is you can do this to kind of change the content of a video. So here they have some kind of playful examples where you can change the specific dress in a video. You can change add hats and stuff like that. It's pretty good, you know, obviously it's not like amazing, but the quality's there, you know. We're getting there. We're starting to get to that inflection point in the S curve. You know, maybe we're like right here, something like that. We're right at this part here. But one thing that they did do in this paper, which I didn't like, is they mask out the face. So they blur the face, right? And why are they doing that? They're, well, the reason for that is that because they're like, oh, uh, for privacy reasons, we blur out the face so that you don't know who it is. But I'm like, first of all, whoever created this video probably doesn't give a shit that you're looking at their face, right? Or else they wouldn't put that video on the internet. But second of all, the face is actually one of the more important parts of the video. I want to, like, you know what I'm saying? I want to see the actual quality of the face because the face is really hard to get right. So I don't know. I thought that was a little little misleading that they kind of like blur out the faces for the humans because I'm like dude that like I want to see how good the face is because that's a really important part of the uh, video generation quality but anyways this paper is mostly really amazing I just that specific part was kind of annoying uh, image to video in painting a cinemagraph uh, animating the content of an image only with a specific user provided image so that's the little like fire on the beach that we just saw uh, evaluation and comparisons. Okay, so we train our T2V model on a data set containing 30 million videos along with their text caption. And again, this is a very small data set, right? So this is kind of what I was saying before, but if you go to the original Stable Video Diffusion, right, this is the original Stable Video Diffusion paper, look at the size of this data set, guys. This is 600 million, right? Like fucking monster data sets. 500 million annotated video clip pairs. Right, and here these guys are getting state-of-the-art video by just fine to by just inflating a text -to image pre-trained text -to image model on 30 million videos. So what the what is this going to look like when they train this from scratch, or 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 th this, but they add basically the extra whatever billion images or bi billion videos on YouTube, right? So it's like they haven't even brought out the big guns, you know? Like this is a Google paper. They technically have YouTube which is like the ace in the sleeve for any kind of video generation stuff. So kind of crazy that they can get state of the art without even resorting to that. Uh, the base model is trained at 128 by 128, right? So that's what it outputs. And then you use the spatial super resolution to get to 1024 by 1024. Uh, whatever, 18 prompts. I wonder if they also do the uh, additional caption kind of augmentation. So. This is something that we saw in this paper here. This is the stable video diffusion paper where they basically augmented the captions using language models and vision language models, where basically now it's popular to take these caption data sets and then just add more elaborate captions. And that kind of gives you more signal to train these kind of conditioning relationships. Uh, yeah, here's the face blurred out, which I'm just like, dude, just show me the face. I guess this is not a generated video, so maybe that's why they're blurring out the face. Uh, they compare to image gen video, animate diff, stable, stable video diffusion, zero scope. This is the results that we were looking at the beginning of the uh, stream here. So if you look at these user studies, people overwhelmingly prefer uh, 
this Lumiere model, you can see compared to ImageGen, Pika, Zeroscope, video quality, unanimously higher, text alignment, unanimously higher. And actually, if you look at like the uh, LLM leaderboard arena, LLM leaderboard, right? This is kind of a similar situation, right? Where you have basically head-to-head -head battles. I think there's, hmm, this is not what I wanted. But, is this what I wanted? Hmm. What I'm looking for is the win rate, right? And you can kind of get the win rate from the ELO, but generally like an ELO that this that's this low generally means that the win rate is kind of just barely above 50-50. So, the difference in language models is starting to kind of plateau right like the the these top ones are almost 50 50 but which is indicative of being at the bot at the top of the s curve right language models kind of at the top of the s curve here but the fact that you can get like an 80 20 win rate 80 percent win rate versus 20 percent win rate on video quality means that the difference here is much bigger right so the difference between state-of-the-art video models is still significantly big which means that we're still on this part of the s-curve for video versus the difference in uh, language models very small very just barely above 50 50 which means that we're kind of getting to this top of the maturity curve here okay uh preferred by users qualitative evaluation generating videos of shorter duration so not only is it state-of-the-art but it's also longer so you can generate five second videos compared to the two seconds and 3.6 seconds so we're getting there you know I feel like five seconds is already beyond the length of the cuts so if you look at a, like modern uh, YouTube videos so I won't pull it up because I don't want to get copyrighted but if you look at like for example a Mr. Beast video all right Mr. Beast is kind of like the pinnacle of content creation on YouTube if you actually pay attention to the cut speed there isn't it's almost like two seconds right it's like two to three seconds like every two to three seconds they cut and then they switch to a different camera they cut and then they switch to a different camera they cut so that cut speed basically determines when we're going to get to a point where you can create even if you think about like a 60 minute movie right there isn't any frame any cut in that 60 minute movie that's longer than I don't know. It depends on the movie, right? If it's like a very slow movie with very slow scenes, then maybe you can have like a minute long cut. But five seconds, that's starting to get to the point where you could make an entire Mr. Beast video cut by cut in five second pieces. Uh, okay. The user study, they evaluated on this whatever UCF 101, but I feel like the user studies are just so much more... Uh, they're better, right? They're way better than these kind of like attempts to use for Shea video distance, inception score. Like these quantitative metrics are kind of a little bit bogus, I think. You can game them. They're not really understandable that much. So I, I very much prefer their user studies. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Let's read this conclusion here. We presented a new text-to-video generation framework utilizing a pre-trained text-to-image diffusion model. We identified an inherent limitation in learning globally coherent motion and the prevalent approach of first generating distant keyframes and subsequently interpolating them using the cascade of temporal super resolution models. To tackle this challenge, we introduce a space-time unit architecture, which I think we're going to see a lot, you know, we're going to see stable video we're going to see stability AI have some version of this, we're going to see Pika and Gen2 have some version of this, we're going to see other open source people basically mimic this thing, and I think that we're going to see this type of space-time unit architecture for other applications like uh, four-dimensional stuff like Gaussian splats and, and kind of like that 3D video. Uh, incorporating spatial and temporal down sampling modules. We demonstrate the state-of-the-art generation results and show the applicability of our approach for a wide range of applications including image to video, video in a painting, I think this is a typo here, it should be in painting, and stylized generation. Generating such content remains an open challenge for future research we establish our model on top of a T2i model that operates in the pixel space. So you should be able to just basically plug and play this, right? Take a stable diffusion model and then just inflate it in the same exact way that they do here and get your own state-of-the-art uh, video generation model. 
Uh, and then, of course, they talk about the uh, societal impact of this because with people making fake videos, it's going to lead to a lot of uh, unsafe stuff. You know, you can't have can't have the people generating videos. It's not safe. Only the government can generate videos. And that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, let's see where we at. We still have a bunch of time, so why don't we look at this paper here? Let me take a little break and then we'll go in. First generation cycle can be hyper complex. Yeah. Okay. So this is the second paper that I wanted to look at today. This is the 21st of January, 2024. This is scalable high resolution pixel space image synthesis with hourglass diffusion transformers. This person is uh, quite known. This is uh, one of the early people that I think worked at a Luther AI, but she's known in the open source community. And if you actually look at the affiliations here, this is not like a, a large situation. You have an independent researcher, independent researcher, you have stability AI, you have some universities here, you have like 20 different things. So this is kind of more just like a, a hodgepodge of random researchers. But this paper, basically, they create a modification to a uh, the diffusion unit, right? So the same kind of idea where basically they want to improve this unit architecture that is used in these diffusion models, right? Like right here, right? They want to improve this, this denoising unit. And the way that they do that is with what they call hourglass transformers. So hourglass transformers are a hierarchical implementation of transformers. And they, they spend a lot of time kind of like dancing around the subject here. Like it took me some time to really be like, dude, what the fuck is this? Why do you keep mentioning this? Can you finally explain it to me? And they go blah, 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 blah. They talk about diffusion. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And I'm like, where, where do they explain this? And then you have to scroll all the way over here. And then they finally tell you what the fuck it is. Right, they spent all this time talking about how it's so much better because rather than being O of n squared, it's going to be O of n, and it, it solves it. Right, we no longer have to do transformer attention mechanisms, and we solved it. We solved it. And I'm like, all right, well, how the fuck did you solve it? And then I scroll all the way down here, and here it is. For every level on the encoder side, we merge two by two tokens into one spatially using pixel unshuffle. And that's it, guys. That's basically this paper. Is this is pooling? <laughs> so basically. The problem is that uh, when you're consuming, when you're using a transformer to basically consume visual tokens, again, the transformer is O of n squared with respect to the input size or the input length, right? So you need to downsample, you need to reduce the size of the, or the number of the vision tokens. So how are you gonna do that? Well, what pixel shuffling and pixel unshuffling is it's basically literally just fucking pooling. You're just literally just taking, okay, well, we have four pixels. Let's just make it one pixel, or in this case, visual tokens. So that's really it. It's basically just a uh, transformer where they downsample using pixel unshuffle and pixel shuffle. And because they downsample, they can basically reduce the total amount of uh, that input sequence, which means that the complexity isn't as bad, which means that you can, I guess, train this faster or run it faster. Yeah, look at this, computational cost. So higher resolution, pixel space, DBIT, this is a transformer. So this is a standard kind of image transformer. You can see that the square kind of resolution, or square kind of uh, scaling there, squared. And this one isn't quite linear, right? Because you're not actually making it linear. What you're doing is you're spatially downsampling using this pixel shuffle, pixel unshuffle. So you get something in between linear and square. It's not quite square, but it's also not quite linear. And the advantage is that for higher resolution images, you can get a lower computational and memory cost. So that's kind of the meat. That's the hourglass diffusion part of this paper. You know, that that's the kind of, I think the, the core idea, but really a lot of this paper is just tricks. It's they have so many tricks in this paper. They're like, oh, we use the EDM trick. We use the uh, different noise level trick. We use this signal noise ratio trick here. We also add a uh, noise schedule trick. So this is like kind of 
as I was saying before, to me, this is like basically super indicative of like uh, getting to this point of the maturity curve, right? When you have these papers, that's like just like this monstrous, like <laughs> like 400 different levels of like things and all these different little tricks all combined together and you get something that is basically just very marginally better than what is already out there. And this is, this is kind of like par for the course, right? Like computer vision papers have a tendency to do that, right? Where it's like you release some new thing and it's clean and then someone makes it, adds an additional optimization loop outside of it and then some other person adds an additional inductive bias over here and then someone else adds a little extra uh, kind of uh, noising and then denoise. So it's like computer vision technology has that trend where it's like you 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 get something new, you add more and more complexity, add more complexity, add more complexity, add more complexity. And then it starts to get to a point where there's so much extra crap that it becomes so difficult to understand that no one can even in incrementally add anything anymore, right? It's like the, the failure of incrementalism comes whenever the total amount of the total volume of stuff that you need to even understand to add one more layer of shit is just beyond 99% of the researchers, right? At some point it gets so complicated that no one else can add one more layer of incrementalist improvement on top of it. And you need these kind of papers like the Lumiere paper, someone to come in and then just take their sword and just cut that Gordian knot and be like, dude, fuck this complexity. Let's just make it way simpler. And turns out that through the magic of the universe, you can get better results that way. Uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll kind of end it there. I don't really feel like there's much else to do. I feel like the main stuff was that. But if you guys have any questions, ask those questions. I'm going to sip on some water here, and then we'll summarize what we went through, and then we'll end the stream. First generation cycle can be used hype. We are ready for my summer car. What do you mean? Pow TT. Puffy TT. I don't know what that name is. Interesting to hear about your take on the S curves for the various areas of development. Yeah, I mean, if you could also take that kind of like the S curves kind of mental model also works for all kinds of things. You know, it also works for society as well. Like if you think about societies like they also kind of follow this s curve right where it's like usually there's some kind of if you guys have ever read kind of like ray dalio's work right there's this there's some kind of war or some kind of revolution and then you start from down here and society is relatively simple relatively simple rules and then complexity starts to kind of add and add and add and initially that complexity kind of makes you go faster right but then it starts to get to a point where the complexity just is too much and too much and it gets too complicated to start a new business. It gets too complicated to do anything. Like the 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 amount of stuff that you need to basically be doing is so overwhelming that no one does anything and then you just kind of have this plateau. And then society basically needs to figure out a way to kind of clean all that legacy crap and then start again from kind of a lower, simpler point. So yeah, this S curve mental model pretty interesting to to use as a as a tool okay let's review this stream so today we uh looked at uh some video generation models the stream is called lumiere hdit this uh lumiere is coming from this paper here lumiere is a space-time diffusion model for video generation this is a new state-of-the-art model released by Google Research and a variety of different uh, Israeli uh, academic institutions. So they have video generation state-of-the-art using the best possible way to evaluate state-of-the-art, right? They had 400 people sit there on Amazon Mechanical Turk, and they had those people basically do this kind of like head-to-head -head battling where you show two videos and you pick which one has the better quality, pick which one is the uh, most aligned to the text, and then uh, they compared it to pretty much all the other state-of-the-arts, right? I remember when 
uh, SVD was state of the art. I remember when Pika was state of the art. I remember when Gen 2 was state of the art, right? And this one beats all of them. So this is the state of the art video generation model. And I think this paper is special because the way that they achieve this state of the art is through a simplification of the current tech stack. So the way that current video to Im or the the way that current video generative models work is they basically have what is what they call a cascaded approach or sometimes you can call this a multi-stage pipeline but basically they're using a diffusion model to generate uh, keyframes right where keyframes in a video are basically temporally spaced uh, frames within the time dimension where the video has height width channels and then this time dimension and then uh, for each of those keyframes, they use what is uh, known as a temporal super resolution model to basically fill in these uh, missing frames to change it from three frames per second to 16 frames per second. And then they'll use a spatial super resolution model to change this 128 by 128 to 1024 by 1024. So that's kind of what people do right now. But the problem with this is that this temporal super resolution model only really pays attention to this kind of local area here, right? It doesn't have a kind of a globally a global awareness to all the stuff that's happening over here. And uh, this spatial super resolution model, because you're kind of forcing it to act uh, only on this window and then the next one acts on this window, you have kind of these temporal boundaries. So two different issues with this. One is the interpolation and the lack of the kind of global awareness and this kind of aliasing effect that happens because of this super resolution model. And then you have the kind of these boundaries due to the global awareness or these boundaries due to the spatial super resolution models, not kind of communicating between there. In this paper, they introduce a space time diffusion model. This space time diffusion model here replaces the uh, diffusion model here to basically uh, create the entire video in one shot. Obviously, it's not one shot because it's a diffusion model, so it's over a series of time steps, iteratively removing noise. So this is still a bunch of inference steps. It's not like it's gonna run once, but it gets rid of this TSR and this extra crap here. It simplifies this pipeline and it gets you a better result. They still use this concept of a spatial super resolution model to go from 128 by 128 to 1024 by 1024, but they add a little bit of overlap here and then they use uh, some basically a fancy type of combination comes coming from this multi-diffusion work. The multi-diffusion is just another paper by this author. This figure basically explains it, right? You basically just have some overlap and then the diffusion is done with respect to both of those such that the uh, final result is kind of smooth. So that's how they fix this part here, this temporal boundary, and then they fix the kind of temporal aliasing by generating the whole thing at once. Uh, what else? This is the STUNet architecture. So the way that they create this architecture is by inflating a pre-trained text-to-image unit. So they basically take an already existing unit. This one is a unit that operates in the latent space. So they use a unit that operates in the pixel space. But they take a unit from an already existing text-to-image model, and then they inflate it which means that they're adding this extra, these extra layers, right? They're basically taking the pre-trained layers and then they add these extra layers. And what these extra layers are doing is they're basically uh, down sampling in space, right? Space is HW, HW becomes H over two times W over two, and then H over four times W over four. And they're also down sampling in time, right? And the way that they do this down sampling is with a convolutional neural network. Here's a little visualization of that. Here's the number two. Right, so you see convolutional neural networks very good at downsampling in space. You can also use them to downsample in time. Uh, and then another awesome little trick that they do here is that rather than, uh, as you see in most units here, where they basically perform attention in order to do these conditioning, so you can condition your generation on things like texts or masks or different things like images, right, whatever you want, Rather than doing this attention mechanism at, multi, at, at all layers of the hierarchy here in the unit, they basically decide to only do this attention only here. And that is a nice little trick, which means that they only need to worry about the uh, quadratic scaling of the attention layers in the m bottleneck of this unit 
which is the most uh, spatially and temporally compressed uh, form of the video. So by doing that, they save themselves a bunch of compute, which is why they can do the entire video at once, right? Because otherwise, if you didn't do that, this model wouldn't even fit on your GPU. Uh, those are kind of the main ideas. Basically, the the attention mechanism, the bottleneck, and the overlap of the spatial resolution to get the unit or to get the uh, using the multi diffusion, and then the uh, the convolutions in time in order to downsample. Those are really, I think, the three main ideas here. But I just feel like this is a, a great paper because one, they get the state of the art, and then two, they basically uh, do all the different things. So it's not just state of the art video generation; it's state of the art video generations with all the fixins, you know. So they have all the side dishes, they have the in painting, they have the stylization, right? All the extra crap that you would want with a video generation. They're just showing here's we did that as as well, you know. So it's not like you need a separate paper now to do the in painting and a separate paper to do the stylization. Just wrap it all together. But the most impressive part of this paper is that they do this with 30 million videos which is absolutely insane, right? Rather, I, I thought when I first opened up this paper that it was just going to be the same architectures that you've seen before, and the only difference is that it's Google, so they trained it for 10 times longer on the YouTube data set, which is 100 times bigger than everybody else's data set. That's what I thought this paper was going to be. But then I was very pleasantly surprised that this is not that at all. It's a very interesting novel architecture design along with... Uh, using a pre-trained text-to-image model, which means that you should be able to basically now do this for all existing text-to-image models. So expect uh, these other companies to basically use this technique as well if they're not already using it uh, and make their own. So I thought that was pretty clever. Uh, that was the, the kind of main meat of the stream. We also kind of briefly went over this paper scalable high resolution pixel space image synthesis with hourglass diffusion transformers this paper is a little bit verbose and complex but you know uh kind of the way that we uh were talking about it uh, to me this hdit paper kind of represents kind of the top of the s curve in terms of the text to image maturity right text to image models they're kind of reaching this top of the S curve. The quality is kind of plateauing. It kind of all feels the same. Whenever I look at these, it doesn't really look that much better than what you get out of Midjourney V6. They're all kind of the same, you know? So the problem with this top of the S curve is that you have so many little tricks that have been accumulated over time that there's this kind of massive volume of little incremental little tricks that you have to kind of put in in order to get just a little bit better than before. Uh, the one trick that they do in this paper that is new is this idea of the hourglass diffusion which is basically downsampling the visual tokens using pixel shuffle and pixel unshuffle which is kind of similar to pooling right it's, it's really not that complicated of a concept but there's so much other crap so many other different little tricks that they pack into this paper that it's quite long so I don't know that was this one but yeah, guys, state-of-the-art video generation. I don't know how long it'll be state-of-the-art, so I brought this up at the beginning of the stream, but uh, the founder from Stability AI is starting to hype something. Feels like another stable diffusion moment. Hold on to your peaches, you know, a little concern for how prepared people are. So I think it. I think we're going to see uh, a state-of-the-art video, video model pretty soon, right? And then once that one comes out, there'll be another one. So... If 2023 and 2022 were the were the years of basically image generation models, I think 2024 and 2025 are going to be the years for video generation models, and we're going to get pretty good pretty fast. So I don't know. We'll see what happens, you know. But I'm excited. Uh, you mentioned Lumiere removes complexity by rethinking. Have you seen other methods suffering from over complexity and could also benefit from rethinking the underlying fundamental methods? Yes. So yesterday we reviewed a bunch of robotics papers and robotics is actually has suffered from this constantly, right? Where to get robots to work, people have to basically incrementally improve what is already being done. So they add little extra modules. And then what you end up with is robotic systems that are composed of 
many different little subsystems that each have different multi-stage kind of situations. And I think robotics is probably going to ultimately be solved by a single vision language model that just consumes the state and the historical state and then outputs actions every single frame, right? So I think robotics is a very, to me, seems like an obvious place where the complexity has kind of gotten out of hand. And if we were to just take a step back, make it simpler, remove the amount of complexity, have a simpler inductive bias and just 10 X, hundred X the scale. We're just, we're there, you know? How do you visualize that though? You don't, that's the problem, right? It's like, why, why does incrementalism work? It's not, it's not like these people are stupid, you know, like these people are very smart. They know what they're doing. The, the problem is the incentives, right? Is that this kind of stuff, it's risky because if you simplify and it doesn't work, it's, you know what I'm saying? That's often can happen. You, you try to simplify and it doesn't work, but you don't have that much time, right? You're a researcher. You have to put papers out. You have to have results. So the incentives are such that it's a lot easier and a lot more safe to then basically just take what's already out there, add a little extra thing, and then it's going to be better, right? Adding a little extra thing is almost always going to, not almost always, but it's a much higher chance of improving the state of the art just a little bit rather than kind of taking a step back and trying something new. So I think it's more the incentives around basically institutions and like improvement and constant improvement rather than uh, kind of taking risks and potentially failing. I think that's the reason, those incentives are the reason why incrementalism happens and why we have this kind of like growing complexity as we go up through the S curve. People should start publishing papers on failures. Yeah, they really should, but nobody wants to do that. That's the problem. We're kind of getting to this point, right? If, if, if you think of the S curve in terms of technology, but now think of it in terms of scientific publishing, we're here. You know, like we're we're at a level where it's kind of plateauing, where it's like everything just like 90% of papers, 99% of papers are just these incrementalist little like add one extra thing, change one little thing, add one extra thing. So as a society, as a scientific community, I feel like we're at the top of an S curve here. We just need to figure out what the next S curve is in terms of scientific community. I think the next S curve is the AIs do this, do the science for us which is a bit unfortunate because it means that humans are done doing science, but I don't know. I think we'll have fun playing VR games, you know? All right, guys, that's all I have. Hopefully that's enough for you guys. If not, join us next week. Um, thank you, 87GN, Magnus, the Yivian, Pal, Aries, Josh, Ed, Maxergus, Mac, Josh, Kalina, Tim Anderson, Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, Spyro. Hope that was useful. Hope you guys are motivated. And see you guys later.